Now I'm going to move on uh, to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Assistant Attorney General Tom Perez, and it's really with a, a great pleasure that we bring him on stage today. I first heard Mr. Perez speak on a Saturday morning here in D.C. I think he donated some of his weekend family time to speak at a conference that I was attending, somewhat like this, very diverse, lots of technical people. Um, I was so impressed by Mr. Perez's warm nature, but also, frankly, his passion for what he does and his ability to reach everyone. So much to the extent that when I thought of who would be someone great to speak at this conference, it wasn't hard to think of him. But also, it does so happen that he's a key player in what we all do now. Assistant Attorney General Tom Perez was appointed to his position in the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice by President Obama in 2009. Prior to this key position, he was a professor at the University of Maryland at the School of Law, and he, was also, he also served as Maryland's Secretary of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation, and was the first Latino on the Montgomery County Council. He served as Special Counsel to Senator Edward Kennedy, and was his principal advisor on civil rights, criminal justice, and constitutional issues. He also worked in the Clinton administration where he served as the director of the Office of Civil Rights for the Department of Health and Human Services. Prior to this recent appointment at the DOJ, Mr. Perez, in his early career, also worked at the department for many years. He was an attorney there and was involved with several high-profile cases, which I won't go into, but they sound pretty intense. Um, so now, the Department of Justice plays an essential role in enforcement of the Military and Overseas Voter Empowerment Act, which we fondly call MOVE, and which will probably be called MOVE for the rest of the day. Um, He's proven through his public service a dedication to fight for the rights of the disenfranchised, and which now applies to the case of empowering the voters we care about so much. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, a man we're really thrilled to have here today, Assistant Attorney General Tom Perez. Great to meet you again. Good morning. It's great to be here. I love coming to Pew. It's, this is uh, one of the uh, most bright spaces. You come in here, the, the sun is always shining, and uh, there's always remarkably interesting and exciting people here. It's fun to look in the audience and see some old friends and uh, meet new friends. So it's, it's really an honor to be here. As, as um, Susan mentioned, I am a recidivist. Uh, this is my second tour of duty at the Department of Justice. And uh, I actually, my first summer in the department was 1986. Uh, Ro uh, Ronald Reagan was the president. Uh, Ed Meese was the attorney general. I then came on as a honors hire in 1989, uh, a career person. And I have uh, great respect for the career staff in the division, and they motivate me to no end, and it is a privilege to work uh, side by side with them. We just celebrated at the um, department uh, the 50th anniversary of the installation of Robert Kennedy as the Attorney General of the United States. And uh, the, the family was there. Other luminaries like John Lewis uh, were there. Uh, a, a hero of mine, a, a gentleman named John Doerr, who headed up the Civil Rights Division. Uh, he, he, like me, initially entered the division uh, in the department under a Republican administration and then uh, came back uh, in the uh, Kennedy administration. And uh, the question was asked, uh, what was Robert Kennedy's enduring legacy as Attorney General? Uh, it was asked of John Lewis, John Doerr, and others. And uh, the answer unequivocally that people gave was ensuring the right to vote. And there were story after story of uh, voter empowerment efforts in the South, people who quite literally gave their lives. And that solemn obligation we have to carry on that legacy 
of enforcing all of the provisions that guarantee the right to vote is something that is uh, that we take very very seriously and we work uh, with uh, partners across government whether it's the Department of Defense or whether it is others to make sure that people have the right to vote and so it's really an honor to be here for the fifth year of um, this summit uh, to listen and learn. It's very timely that we have this conference. Um, I used to teach at Maryland Law School, and uh, I was the clinic director, and I would tell my students, uh, plan, execute, reflect. That's the key to being a good lawyer. Uh, make sure you're out there planning and planning aggressively and strategically. Um, execute thoroughly and then reflect. And today is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on what has been done uh, in the MOVE Act, and I look forward uh, to sharing uh, some of our thoughts here. Uh, as you well know, our nation's very existence relies on the ability of every citizen to have his or her voice heard. And as I've said already, the right to vote is among our most basic rights, and it is indeed so precious and so fundamental that it cannot be denied to anyone. Um, and especially our men and women who are in uniform and our uh, citizens living abroad. And so we have a long and proud history in the division and the department of enforcing UACAVA and its predecessors because they do ensure that the franchise indeed travels with military service members and their families as well as American civilians living abroad. It protects the most fundamental of those who give of themselves, sometimes making remarkable sacrifices so they can protect our rights. I've had some remarkable opportunities in my outreach to visit uh, military bases and talk to commanding officers about how we can work with service members, whether it's enforcing employment laws, enforcing the SCRA, enforcing uh, the MOVE Act. Uh, we have a robust set of uh, laws in the division that protects people who are indeed protecting us. And we all have today uh, a common objective, which is to do all we can, whatever our role in this room is, and I know there are uh, friends and colleagues from the states here, and uh, many of whom I know very well, and many of whom I've worked with in this and in other uh, capacities, and we're all in this together, because our goal is to make sure that we realize the meaning of Uakava, of ensuring, bless you, by the way, bless all of you for that matter. <laughs> I don't want to single you out. We're all about equal opportunity in the Civil Rights Division, equal opportunity to be blessed. Uh, and our goal, our shared goal, is to ensure that all military and overseas voters who wish to participate in our democracy have that meaningful opportunity to cast their ballots. I remember as the son of immigrants uh, when my mother was first uh, naturalized and voted for the first time, what a remarkably empowering experience that was. Uh, my father got his citizenship when he served in uh, the U.S. Army and uh, he was a legal immigrant and he was asked, raise your hand if you want to become a citizen and he raised his hand and he never missed an opportunity to vote in his life and that is what, that was a value they instilled in us. And it's a value that's near and dear to the heart of Eric Holder and to our colleagues in the Civil Rights Division. Attorney General Holder has made very clear his commitment to the enforcement of voting and other civil rights laws, and we are, con we are continually committed to enforcing them consistently, aggressively, independently, and even-handedly. Last year, with the assistance of the President, the Attorney General, and the support of Congress, the Civil Rights Division received a significant infusion of resources. And where did the resources go? They went to a lot of places, but the section that got the most resources from that new infusion was the voting section because we recognized that enforcing to ACAVA, enforcing the Voting Rights Act, enforcing the NVRA, enforcing all of the voting laws that are within our responsibility is absolutely critical and fundamental. And we also recognize that we had the MOVE Act. We were very excited to be part of the process of providing technical assistance 
for the passage of that act. We recognize that the day President Obama signed that act, that was the time to begin preparing for implementation. And that's indeed what we did. Because the division does have a long history of protecting military and overseas voters, even before the enactment of UACAVA in 86, the division was enforcing the rights of military and overseas voters using its authority under predecessor statutes. And since the enactment in 86 of UACAVA, uh, the Justice Department has brought roughly 40 UACAVA lawsuits, most of them because uh, election officials had mailed absentee ballots too late. And in every case, we've succeeded in obtaining agreements or court orders for emergency relief, such as extending the deadline for receipt of ballots, expanding the use of federal write-in absentee ballots, or providing and or providing for accelerated transmission of ballots by fax, email, or FedEx, or, or I should say overnight delivery. I am a non-partisan uh, um, overnight service. <laughs> Equally importantly, the department has had considerable success in obtaining structural changes necessary to ensure that states can comply with UACAVA in future elections. For example, as a result of a lawsuit we brought in Pennsylvania, the legislature in 2006 made permanent changes to facilitate UACAVA uh, compliance, including extending the deadline for receiving absentee ballots from UACAVA voters. Similarly, in Georgia, after the court obtained uh, emergency relief for the 2004 primary elections, uh, Georgia uh, obtained legislation, adopted legislation making permanent changes needed to avoid similar violations. When Congress passed the MOVE Act, we got right to work. The law, as you know, greatly expanded the protections afforded military and overseas voters, and the division has indeed um, supported and put in place a remarkable amount of effort to ensure that the meaning and the spirit and the letter of the law is indeed carried out. I want to thank my colleagues in the division and in the um, voting section in particular for their remarkably uh, heroic efforts during the course of preparing and enforcing uh, the MOVE Act. We recognize it's a solemn responsibility, and so as a result, it became an all-hands-on-deck enterprise for us. In, in the lead-up to uh, the November 2010 election, we devoted more than 20 staff members. That's about uh, almost half of our litigation team to a national effort. We reached out to every state and to the territory. So we had 56 different jurisdictions with whom we were working. This was an enforcement program that was unmatched in any of our federal election cycle uh, work projects to date. And we touched every state and territory. We explained the requirements of UACAVA. We provided information to states and territories. And we watched as states made remarkably um, uh, fast progress in carrying out the uh, uh, obligations that they had under UACAVA. But we also didn't hesitate to take action when we saw that states or territories had fallen short in carrying out their responsibilities. We took enforcement actions in 14 jurisdictions, including 11 states, two territories, and the District of Columbia. So we filed lawsuits in five, including one, and we obtained one court order, four court-approved consent decrees. In the other jurisdictions, we obtained four out-of-court memorandum agreements and five letter agreements. We were vigilant east, west, north, south. We had enforcement actions in New York. We had enforcement actions in Alaska. We had enforcement actions in Mississippi. We had enforcement actions in Hawaii and Guam. We had the hearing in Guam. We participated by telephone. It took place at about midnight East Coast time. I'm not sure quite what the uh, attorneys were wearing. I know they were clothed. I'm not sure if they were wearing their pajamas, but I do know that they did a wonderful job because we were able to obtain the relief to protect military and overseas voters who were residing in Guam. We took enforcement actions where violations affected many voters, such as New York State. 
and we took enforcement actions in places such as Nevada, where there was one county, and we were able to obtain relief for 35 voters in that county. And so we were looking at uh, large issues, we were looking at smaller issues, because every vote is sacred. And that was our operating principle. We consulted actively with the Department of Defense, our colleagues, many of whom are here today, to address the state's request for waivers from the MOVE Act's 45-day advanced ballot transmission requirement. Of the 12 jurisdictions that applied for waivers, six were denied. And uh, on the same day that those six jurisdictions were denied, we informed them that litigation had been authorized. Because one thing we learned early on in this is that time is of the essence. You cannot waste a moment in terms of ensuring compliance. And so our attorneys, once DOD made the determination that a waiver was not to be granted, we immediately began working with them. And of the jurisdictions where we took enforcement actions, six of the 14 were related to waivers that were denied to the states. And our quick negotiations in those cases resulted in consent decrees with Wisconsin and out-of-court settlements with the other five jurisdictions. The Wisconsin degree, uh, decree, by uh, way of example, included uh, an extension of the ballot receipt deadline to provide a minimum 45 days transit for Uakava ballots, as well as notice to Uakava voters of the decree's provisions. And similarly, our, our MOA with D.C. required an extended ballot uh, receipt deadline and notice to voters. Uh, in Hawaii, our agreement required the state to send ballots by express delivery to provide voters with the means to return their completed ballots by express delivery free of charge, ensuring that Uakava voters had sufficient time to receive cast and return their ballots. I'm also pleased to report that the uh, legislature in Hawaii acted to correct the state's structural problem for future elections by moving the state's federal election primary date from, August, from September to August. Our agreements with Alaska, Colorado, and the U.S. Virgin Islands ensured that election officials in those jurisdictions would take the necessary steps to ensure that Uakava ballots were in fact mailed by the 45th day before the general election, despite the denial of their request for a waiver seeking an exemption from this requirement. Also, in the waiver context, we filed a lawsuit against New York, notwithstanding the fact that they had received a waiver, and we filed a lawsuit because we learned that they weren't in compliance and that there were quite literally tens of thousands of ballots and people who were in harm's way of having their right to vote uh, uh, denied or abridged. And as a result, we were able to negotiate a consent decree with New York that mandated corrective measures, including the um, extension of the ballot receipt deadline. We also spent uh, considerable resources initiating enforcement actions for failure to comply with the 45-day requirement in states that had not sought waivers. So Illinois and New Mexico are two examples. We filed lawsuits, resolved them with consent decrees that, among other things, again extended the ballot deadline, ballot receipt deadline to ensure a minimum of 45 days. The Illinois consent decree also required that the state take remedial efforts to transmit ballots electronically to any Uakava voters who requested electronic transition, uh, transmission, which as you know and, and your report notes is a requirement of the MOVE Act. And we obtained similar relief in Kansas, Mississippi, uh, Nevada, and North Dakota. So in short, our enforcement program will, I hope you have seen, has demonstrated that we had all hands on deck. We were indeed prepared. We worked with every single state. Our goal was to have 100% compliance. Our goal was to have zero lawsuits. But when, they, when we see that there uh, was not compliance, we were not hesitant to take enforcement action to ensure that we carried out both the letter and the spirit of the MOVE Act. And I believe and I'm very proud of the work that we did in uh, the voting section of the Civil Rights Division because I truly believe that our extensive um, prevention, outreach, education, and enforcement efforts enabled thousands of military and overseas voters to obtain access to the ballot in a timely fashion. I also want to mention our um, recent success in resolving a pre-MOVE Act case that we had in Virginia. The federal court approved a consent decree 
uh, with Virginia this past uh, December, which concluded uh, lengthy litigation that was initiated in the um, 2008 cycle to enforce UACAVA in that year's cycle and to ensure uh, full compliance. Uh, so uh, in 2009, the court ruled that Virginia had violated UACAVA when the local officials in numerous jurisdictions failed to mail ballots to military and overseas voters in a timely fashion. And in this case, Virginia argued that it didn't violate the law by sending the ballots late, and it should not be required to count any of the late mailed ballots at, at, that it received after the deadline because they didn't make a difference in the outcome of the elections and because the courts did not have the power to order the counting of the ballots. And I'm happy to report that the court categorically rejected those arguments, stating not only did it have the authority, but, and I quote, in order to uphold and give meaning to the dearest of individual rights, unquote, it would order the valid ballots that were mailed late and arrived late to be counted, even if they didn't affect the outcome of the election. I appreciate the doggedness of our team in that case, and the court also agreed with our view that steps must be taken to ensure compliance with UACAVA going forward. And all of the agreements that I've referred to obtained relief for what was taking place in 2010, but also have provisions moving forward so that we're getting data from states, we're analyzing that data, and we're hearing back and having dialogue with them about how to uh, prevent future problems from occurring. And that December decree that I referred to in Virginia was the product of the party's efforts to create a plan. The principles embodied in that plan, I think, can be instructive uh, to other states. And I, I urge you to take a look at what we did in uh, the Virginia case. I very much appreciate the efforts of everybody in this room. You are here today because we have a shared interest in ensuring 100 percent participation and 100 percent access to the ballot for everyone. Now is a time to reflect. We're getting information from the Election Assistance Commission. We're getting information from states pursuant to the decrees that we have entered into and the letter agreements and other documents that we have. We are getting information such as the report that you did that I read. Uh, I, I confess I sped read it because I only uh, got it recently, but I look forward to reading this with a fine tooth comb, going through it to figure out what did we do well, where is there room for improvement. Again, plan, execute, reflect. Uh, in our reflections today, we want to hear from you. You know, where did we do well? Where do you think there's room for improvement? If you know of a jurisdiction where you think there were specific problems, I hope you will bring it to the attention of one of our career professionals who are here today and will be here throughout the course of the day. Because our goal is your goal. Our goal is one goal, which is to ensure that the access to the ballot, the sacred access, that sacred right that we all have, is indeed a reality and is not illusory. Some states, you know, we, we're, we're obviously in the process right now of reflecting internally, looking at lessons um, that we are learning, and um, there are some obvious lessons. Some states may need to make big changes that require legislative action. You know, for instance, moving the primary date, as I mentioned, Hawaii has already done. Other states may require smaller but equally important uh, changes to ensure uh, full compliance. And we will remain active in this conversation because uh, we want to learn from you about what we can indeed do working collaboratively to make this system and this process work. And I know that um, uh, colleagues in the Secretary of State and other election officials Oh, good morning, Linda. Sorry. You know, once in a while you run into an old friend, uh, Linda Lamone from Maryland, my home state. Uh, I know that Linda and others um, are taking a hard look at what they learned from the most recent cycle and what they can do moving forward uh, to ensure that there is indeed 100 percent access. And I, I loved looking at your agenda to see um, the various presentations ranging from your your survey research to discussions um, by state officials of their experiences and challenges. 
and uh, discussions from our colleagues at the Department of Defense in terms of what they learned from this. Uh, this is a great opportunity to reflect, learn, and adjust moving forward. We look forward to being part of this dialogue. We look forward to being part of this partnership because, indeed, uh, I have one of the uh, best jobs in America because we are in the equal opportunity business. Through our enforcement of civil rights laws, we provide the equal opportunity to earn, we provide and, and facilitate the equal opportunity to learn, the equal opportunity to, the, to realize the American dream of home ownership, and the equal opportunity to access that most sacred right, the right to vote. We ensure that the fundamental infrastructure of democracy is vibrant. That is what you do as well if you're a Secretary of State or if you are a part of the foundation. You are working together to ensure that this fundamental infrastructure of democracy, the right to vote, is an infrastructure that remains robust. And the MOVE Act is a critical addition to that infrastructure of democracy. And I look forward to listening, learning, and working with you to make sure that we are moving forward 100% compliance and taking the lessons of yesterday, applying them to the elections of tomorrow. So thank you for welcoming me here today. Thank you for your leadership. I am a former local elected official. I've had the privilege of working in local government. I've had the privilege of working in state government. And I've had the privilege of working in the federal government. I've had the privilege of working in all three branches of government. I recognize that we are all in this together. I recognize and appreciate acutely the challenges that uh, state governments have, the challenges that local election officials have. I hope you appreciate the job that we have to do. It's a very important job, as is yours. We are all indeed in this together. The better we communicate, the better we share information, the more honest we can be with each other, the more successful we will be. And I am confident that we will be successful in carrying out this most sacred obligation that we have. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for coming here to share your stories of success and your lessons of where you hit a pothole or two so that we can smooth those potholes out and create uh, a roadmap for compliance uh, into the future. Thank you very much and have a great, great program. <laughs>